So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the microscopic picture of harmonically trapped Bose and Fermi gases. And sort of the idea is really that the workshop that we'll have is going from few to many body physics. And I think deriving, sort of developing a microscopic picture is really um, crucial for understanding these systems. So the outline of my talk or this lecture is uh, given here. It's a very coarse outline. I tell you a little bit in just a few words about the two-body interactions and the scattering lengths. And then I move on to talk about two, three, and more particles in the trap. And I focus both on fermions and on bosons. So the first part of the lecture is going to be more on fermions, and the second part is going to be more on bosons. And sort of in thinking about these um, systems, about cold atom systems, I think we are motivated by this, um, this sort of these achievements that quantum degeneracy can be reached with both bosons and fermions. So on the left here is a picture of composite bosons of rubidium-87 being cooled as we go down here. So here we have a um, thermal cloud that's being cooled, and this is a picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate. On the other hand here, we have a fermionic cloud. So this is for potassium-40 composite fermion. And what you can see is that it's, as it's being cooled, it doesn't actually shrink in this picture as much as the bosonic system. That's a direct reflection of the fact that we have the Pauli exclusion principle at work. And so there's sort of the Pauli pressure that sets a limit on how sort of small the cloud can be or set differently. We have individual atoms occupying single particle states and um, so there's really a difference between a degenerate Fermi gas and the Bose-Einstein condensate, both of which are degenerate. So um, what are these composite bosons and composite fermions? You might say, well, we're looking at atoms. Atoms consist of electron, neutrons, and protons. And so each of these are clearly fermions. So how can I speak of a composite boson and a composite fermion? Of course, bosons are half-integer spin particles. Examples are the photon and the mesons. The mesons consists of quark and antiquark, which themselves are, again, fermions. And fermions, on the other hand, are half-integer particles and examples in the electron, quarks, baryons, and so on. And so if we look at an atom, um, sort of the most prominent examples historically might be helium-4 and helium-3. Um, the helium-4 atom is a composite boson. The helium-3 atom is a composite fermion. And the difference between them is that the helium-3 atom has a neutron missing. So we have one fermion less in the system. And so if we add up all the spins, we find that helium-3 is a fermion and therefore has vastly different properties than the helium-4 atoms if we put them together, for example, in a quantum liquid. If we look at um, the alkalis, so throughout this talk, we are interested in, say, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. Then we see for lithium-6, which has a nuclear spin of 1, we have three electrons, three neutrons, and three protons. And if you add up these um, nine fermions, then you find that you must have, again, uh, um, fermionic system. So you end up with a half-integer spin. And typically, in these cold atom systems, the temperatures are so low that we're not actually probing the internal structure of the atoms. So the fact that we have these electronic degrees of freedom, these nuclear degrees of freedom, it's not being probed. And we really see, for the most part, lithium-6 behave as if it was just a fermion. If, on the other hand, we look at lithium-7, so we add a neutron, then adding up the angular momenta, we actually find it's a composite boson. So if we go a little bit further and say, okay, 
let's think about a non-interacting um, system. Let's just consider bosons here to start with, non-interacting particles. They don't have internal structure, although they're smiley faces here. What you can do is you can place them in a harmonic trap. These are the single particle energy levels. And in this cartoon picture, a condensate would just be all the particles occupying the lowest single particle state. On the other hand, if we have a single component Fermi gas, so we have just one species of fermions, say they all spin up, then we would have each fermion occupy one single particle state, and so this would be a degenerate Fermi gas. In this talk, I'm more interested in a two-component Fermi gas. So we have two species, call them spin up, spin down. In the, in the atomic system, these would be two different hyperfine states that are being occupied by the same, say, atom. So this could be to potassium-40, for example. And um, <clears throat> so here, we have one atom or one spin state per single, or one spin per single particle state. And so because we have two different spin types here, we can have two particles per single particle level. And in these systems, one of the questions is really, how does this picture change if we turn on S-wave interactions? So in discussing the interactions, um, I like to think about this as going, sort of viewing it in the context of going from few body physics to many body physics, going from few particles to many particles. And sort of the idea is to think about going from the microscopic system, where we just have, say, a few atoms, to the mesoscopic system, where we may have um, 20 atoms or 100 atoms or so, to the thermodynamic limit, where we have a condensed matter system. And um, I think uh, many of the cold atom um, studies are really motivated by um, things that have been done on helium droplets. So helium clusters um, have been investigated extensively, both helium-4 clusters and helium-3 clusters. And sort of interesting um, observations there are to sort of understand what it means to have superfluidity coming from the microscopic end. And then looking at this, <clears throat> molecular rotations have been investigated. So these helium droplets have been doped with molecules, and then the transition of, say, the moment of inertia as the system gets bigger has been looked at. And sort of an analogy to, the, to that, if we look at metal clusters, the concept or the, the sort of conductivity has been watched, has been analyzed as the system is grown, as the system becomes bigger. And of course, for these uh, metallic systems, there's a clear drive to use this to really design new materials, new nanomaterials. So in um, sort of being motivated by, by these studies from the um, liquid helium, helium droplet um, literature, we can think a little bit about what's actually special about these bosonic and fermionic atomic gases. And um, I think one of the things that is really special about them is that we can tune the interactions, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And this means that there's actually universal behavior. There's um, a regime where we can get to where the system behavior is universal. And um, so that gives us a very clean way of looking at strongly correlated systems. And of course, this um, is sort of goes in hand with a lot of experimental progress in probing these systems. Um, moreover, we can confine these atoms in external potentials, so either in a harmonic trap or in an optical lattice. And there's a lot of interesting physics um, to be looked at. So to sort of um, highlight this connection between the cold atomic gases and between quantum liquids or helium droplets a little bit more, I like to look at two concrete examples. The first one is um, an example 
where the vorticity in liquid helium droplets has actually been looked at. This is a fairly recent um, experiment led by Andrei Vilesov. And um, what they basically do is they have a molecular beam experiment here, the little droplet, it goes through um, a cell where it can pick up um, sort of additional atoms, in this case, xenon. And then the uh, vortex formation can actually be probed by looking at the system with a free electron laser. So this is actually a quite involved experiment um, and then the, water, the formation of vortices has actually been imaged. So I don't want to go through this in detail, but this is sort of the cartoon picture that evolves from this. So they can really visualize these vortices in liquid helium, where the interparticle spacing is just a few angstroms, which is very different from the situation in the cold gases that we'll be talking about, where the interparticle the average interparticle spacing might be closer to, say, a thousand angstroms or so. And now going a little bit more from the um, many particle limit to the few particle limit, um, liquid or helium-4 systems have also been used to look at ephemer physics, and that's clearly the smoking gun, has been the smoking gun, one of the smoking guns of few body physics. And in these, um, again, molecular beam experiments, um, in this case, trimers have been formed. The excited state of the helium trimer is actually an FMOF state. And um, the FMOF state was imaged directly experimentally. So the um, image that was um, obtained experimentally is shown here. So these are the three helium atoms and a distinct structure that's sort of corresponding to a more elongated triangle was identified for the excited state. And so I think this again highlights that the um, sort of experiments, the studies that have been done with uh, helium droplets, with small helium systems, have a lot in common and um, there are a lot of things we can look at and vice versa. Um, when we talk about atomic gases. So with this, I want to um, talk a little bit about the interactions that we have in these cold gases. Um, we have a hyperfine Hamiltonian that couples the singlet and triplet potential curves. And I've chosen um, a rather exotic example here where I'm showing the potential curves for two tritium atoms. Um, the reason I've chosen this is for two reasons. A tritium atom is at first sight fairly similar to a hydrogen atom, so we are all familiar with the Born-Oppenheimer potential curves for um, H2. So we have the singlet curve here and the triplet curve. And the other reason that I've chosen this tritium tritium, trit, the reason why I've chosen this tritium tritium example is that it actually does exhibit a Feshbach resonance, um, in this case, at fairly high magnetic fields. So what we have here is we have a coupling of the singlet and triplet potential curves, and as the magnetic field is being turned on um, here, what um, you find is that the hyperfine levels are actually being shifted. And in some cases, that can give rise to a Feshbach resonance. So these are the results from a coupled channel calculation where the S-wave scattering length is calculated as a function of the magnetic field. And what you can see is that the scattering length really goes through um, a divergence here. So this allows for the realization of very large scattering lengths, large positive scattering lengths, and also um, very large negative scattering lengths. And this is really one of the sort of important aspects of cold atoms, namely that we can tune the interaction strengths. So we can think about the scattering lengths as being directly proportional to the interaction strengths. One thing that I should probably mention is that in terms of working practically with tritium, it's a very hard element to work with, um, partially because it's radioactive. And so who wants to work with radioactive materials? I mean, people like to 
but it's challenging. So um, in a sort of effective way, we can describe the S-wave scattering lengths as a function of the magnetic field here by this formula where we have the uh, background scattering lengths, that's just the value of the scattering lengths um, far away from the resonance. Then we have the resonance position, this B sub R, that's where the resonance is located. And then we have a resonance width, this delta B, which in this case is actually quite large. So if I was drawing this more accurately, it would start here and go all the way out here. So it's actually a fairly broad resonance. So what I'm going to assume for the following is that um, as we go through this resonance, the um, occupation of the um, closed channel molecule is very small. And this allows me to basically model the atom-atom interactions in a fairly simplistic way. So I can just use either a zero range model or a square well potential or some other very simple model. Rudy in his talk will talk a little bit more about broad and narrow resonances in situations where you can actually not get away with these very simplifying um, descriptions. Okay. So I mentioned the square well potential. Let's take a look at it just to remind ourselves of what the scattering length is about in this very simple single channel um, model. So here we have the square well potential. I'm going to assume that the range is fixed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the depths of this potential. And as I make the depths deeper, what happens is the S-wave scattering length, which starts at zero when there isn't a potential, becomes negative. Then it goes through a resonance, another one, and another one. And each time the scattering length diverges, we pull in a new two-body S-wave bound state. So we have regions here where the potential supports one bound state, two bound states, and three bound states, and so on. And it's important here that this uh, potential that I've chosen, in this case, the square well potential, allows us to really go and treat very small interaction ranges. So I can even take this range to zero, and it essentially drops out of the problem. If I was to compare this with a hardcore potential, then I couldn't do this. I wouldn't be able to do this because the scattering length in that case is directly proportional. It's, the, it's, it's given by the range of the interaction. So if I do want to go to a large scattering length, I automatically have a large range in my system. And for our purposes, we, are not, we, we don't want that. OK, so let's look a little bit at the wave functions of the um, square well potential. And to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus to start with on the regimes where the S-wave scattering length diverges. This is the regime that we call unitarity. And so um, if we look at the scaled radial wave functions, they look like this. Outside, we just have a constant. And inside, we see that the wave function actually varies and changes as we have more and more bound states. And of course, the fact that the outside wave function is um, independent of the um, interaction is clear. Outside, we don't have the interaction potential that's um, active. And it's this outside region that's described by the S-wave scattering lengths. So if we look at the wave function here, we can write it as a, super, as a sum of the regular solution, the irregular solution, sine and cosine. And the relative weight between these two is given by the tangent of the phase shift. And then minus the tangent of the phase shift divided by k, that's just our S-wave scattering lengths. And so even though the depths for these potentials here is different, the scattering length in all these cases is actually identical because it's just sort of describing the outside portion of the wave function. So if we now look and um, change the depths a little bit, 
such that we have either uh, negative scattering lengths or a positive scattering lengths, then we see these type of wave functions here. For example, if I look at the negative scattering lengths case, what you see is if you take the outside solution and you just connect it, you, you sort of draw a straight line here, you see that the outside, that the wave function has essentially a node at negative radius and that node is then interpreted that's exactly equal to the S wave scattering lengths. So the other thing that I want to mention here is that the inside solution, of course, um, depends on the interaction potential. But typically, if we are at low temperatures, these details are not being probed. And that is because the de Broglie wavelength is very large. So we are at very low temperatures. We have a large de Broglie wavelength. And you can just sort of make a resolution argument that if your de Broglie wavelength is very large, you can actually not resolve the fine details inside the interaction potential. And so this means in cold atom physics, oftentimes these details do not matter, um, at least for a subset of observables. Okay, so now let's go and um, take a zero range interaction potential. So we can get there simply by taking, say, the square well potential, making the range smaller and smaller, and making the depth steeper or we can write it down directly in terms of a pseudo-potential where we have a delta function interaction. We have a regularization operator here that sort of makes everything well-behaved. And we have an interaction strength G, which is directly proportional to the S-wave scattering lengths. And in this case, um, what we're interested in, we're interested in placing these two particles that are interacting through this pseudo-potential in an external harmonic trap. We separate off the center of mass and we look at this relative Hamiltonian here, which is written down for each of the angular momentum channels. And so if we now want to solve for the eigenenergies of the system, we can do this by realizing that this pseudo potential actually implement or imposes a boundary condition on the scaled radial wave function that's given here. So the logarithmic derivative of the scaled radial wave function is just given by minus one over the S wave scattering lengths. And then Thomas Bush worked out how the eigen energy actually depends on the scattering lengths in this case. So we have this transcendental equation that can be solved and that tells us how the two-body energies um, actually depend on the S-wave scattering lengths. So if we look at this and we actually plot this, we find this picture here. What I'm showing is the energy of the relative energy of two particles in a harmonic trap as a function of one over the S-wave scattering lengths. So this means that the non-interacting regimes are here on the far left and on the far right and in the middle here we have the strongly interacting regime. And so you can think about this energy spectrum, these uh, black lines as being divided sort of into two classes. There's this lowest curve which is really the curve that if we take away the trapping potential simply corresponds to the bound state of the free space system. So to a good approximation on this positive scattering length side, the binding energy is given by this expression. And then we have these dashed lines here, and these represent the states that used to be scattering states. So by turning on the trapping potential, the scattering continuum gets discretized, and um, these are the energy levels that emerge. In the non-interacting limit, let's look on the right, we just have the um, normal, if you want, energy of 3 half h per omega, and then 7 half h per omega, and so on. And then as the, inter as the scattering length gets turned on, then the energy levels all get pushed up, because we have an effectively repulsive interaction here. 
when I should say is these are just the S-wave energy states of the system, the um, states for finite angular momentum, so P-wave, D-wave, and so on. They're not affected by the zero range pseudo-potential that I'd written down. And so they would just be straight lines on these, this plot, and um, I didn't show them. Okay? So this gives us just sort of the simplest trapped system. This could be for two distinguishable particles or for two identical bosons. And so what I want to do now is I sort of want to um, flash this picture here which is um, an experimental image from the BCS to BEC crossover. So on the left, we have a negative scattering length. On the right, we have a positive scattering length. And in the middle, there's an image of a two-component Fermi gas when the S-wave scattering length is infinitely large. So this is in the middle the unitary gas and the first thing to notice here is that the gas is actually stable, so there are no disasters happening as the scattering length is changed from small and um, negative to small and positive. And sort of the question that I want to pose is, if we look at these type of few-body systems like two-body, three-body, and so on, what can we learn from these few body studies about um, these BCS, BEC crossover studies that are done typically in the many body limit? And um, they're done for dilute gases, so the range of the interactions are much smaller than the harmonic oscillator lengths, much smaller than the absolute value of the scattering lengths, or said differently. We're actually dealing with a dilute gas where the peak density times the range cubed is much less than one. So can we use our two-body, three-body, four-body systems to explain at least a subset of the features that we see in the many-body system? And the answer is yes, we can. And um, to look at this, um, I start with this picture. So this is for um, sort of a, just a schematic sketch for a free space system at the moment. So we don't have a trap here. Negative scattering lengths is on the left. Positive scattering lengths is on the right, just as in my previous plots. And so if we don't have a trap, um, the weakly attractive regime would just be sort of flying apart. It's, there's no bound state. So that's a very important message here. The up, up, down trimer or tetramers are not actually bound. Um, and throughout, I'm restricting myself to the equal mass system. And on the um, positive scattering length side, we can form dimers. So this lower branch here is for the formation for two dimers. The upper branch here is for the formation of one dimer and two atoms. And uh, what was pointed out by Petrov and others is that the atom dimer S-wave scattering length is directly proportional to the S-wave scattering length, the atom-atom scattering length, and it's positive. And similarly, the dimer dimer S-wave scattering length is positive and also determined just by a num numerical factor times the atom-atom scattering lengths. So there's sort of two things that we can take away from this sketch. One is the atom-dimer and dimer-dimer scattering lengths are positive, so that means we have effective repulsion. That leads to stabilization, if we go back to this picture here. And the other thing is that um, we don't have bound weakly bound trimers or tetramers. And so this means that cluster formation is actually very strongly suppressed in these two component Fermi gases. So this is sort of the, the first messages that we can take away. So now what I want to do is I want to um, go beyond the two-particle picture that um, I've discussed before and go to three particles and more particles and sort of see how does the, how do the energy spectra look for three fermions in a trap, for example. 
there's an example here. So this is for a system of um, two up particles and one down particle. I've shown two example spectra. One is for an angular momentum, for the angular momentum one manifold. The other is for the angular momentum zero manifold. So the orbital angular momentum is a good quantum number in these systems, and we can look at each of these spectra separately. And sort of one thing here is that if we look in the non-interacting limit, um, sort of very far to the left here, what you find is that the state with orbital angular momentum one actually has a lower energy than the state with orbital angular momentum zero, which is this lower sketch here. And the reason is very simple. We have two identical fermions here. The, fam the wave function has to be anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two identical fermions. So we can draw a Jacobi tree like this. If we exchange these two guys, we need to pick up a minus sign. We pick that up by putting the two um, sort of reddish particles into different single particle states, and then the blue particle can sit down here. If, on the other hand, we want to construct a state that has zero orbital angular momentum, the blue particle actually has to also carry angular momentum so that the first angular momentum and the second one can couple to give us a zero angular momentum. So in the weakly attractive regime, the orbital angular momentum state with um, angular momentum one has the lowest energy. On the other hand, if we now go to the sort of BEC regime here, where we see all these diving curves which describe atom dimer states, then we can see quite easily that the lowest state should have zero orbital angular momentum. We can just take this dimer plus atom picture. We have a dimer here. We can think about this as a composite particle, and we have the third particle relative to this, and this um, Jacobi vector now does not have to carry angular momentum. So the L is zero state is actually lower here. So we have a crossover, if you want, from angular momentum one to angular momentum zero as we go from weakly attractive to um, weakly repulsive. And um, we can sort of go to larger systems. Um, we can look at, you know, I just told you about the, oh, sorry, I just told you about the 2-1 um, system. We can look at the 2-2 two, two system. One finds that the ground state has vanishing angular momentum every, everywhere. We can look at the 3-1 system, the 4-1 system, and so on. And sort of one of the questions then is really, okay, we can sort of think about these systems very nicely in the weekly attractive region in the weakly repulsive reason region, and we can sort of reason what the symmetry should be and so on. But what do we really learn from this? Well, if we now ask, how do we go to larger systems? Um, what does the system look like at unitarity when the interactions are really strong? Then we have to think about sort of the competing effects. On the one hand, we have sort of these shell closures, which are closely tied in with the orbital angular momentum discussion that I just presented. But on the other hand, we have this tendency to form pairs. And in some sense, these, these two effects are sort of competing. And one question is, if we sit in the strongly interacting regime, do we still see shell closures just the way we see in the weakly attractive regime? Or does the um, tendency to form pairs really wash out the shell structure entirely? And um, it turns out that the tendency to form pairs is actually quite strong. I'll show you this on the next slide. But before I do this, I also um, want to point out that if we do go to the large S-wave scattering lengths regime, so if we send our scattering lengths to infinity, then this really means that we're sort of losing a length scale in our system. So an infinite scattering length 
does not actually define a meaningful length scale for our problem. And um, if you think about this in terms of hyperspherical coordinates, where this hyperradius is just the size of the system, that's enough for now um, for you to know, then what you find is that this effective hyperradial potential looks in terms of the functional form just like the kinetic energy term would look like. So it's just the 1 over r squared term here. And then what the scattering lengths does, in essence, is it sort of modifies this number up here. So as opposed to having something like an orbital angular momentum squared or the eigenvalue of that, we have a number here that reflects the fact that the scattering length is present, but it's actually infinitely large. And sort of this, this is a, another way of really thinking about this unitary system that you do lose the length scale in the problem, and there should be universal aspects to the problem. So here's what we, um, what is found for um, larger particles. So this is at unitarity, and I'm looking at a case where either we have a fully balanced system, so the number of up particles is equal to the number of down particles, that's the green line here, and I'm plotting the energy at unitarity as a function of the numbers of fermions in the system. So of the first thing you notice here is that if we add an extra particle, so we introduce a spin imbalance, all the energies for the spin imbalance systems lie a little bit above the ones for the balanced system. So there's a clear, odd, even staggering, but we don't really see much of a shell structure. So we don't see real bumps in these green lines or real bumps in the red lines. So this is what I meant earlier when I said, okay, the pairing really does seem to win over the shell structure effects. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can apply the local density approximation to the spin balance system. And what one finds then is that the energy of the trapped system at unitarity is directly proportional to the energy of the non-interacting system with the proportionality factor being the square root of the Birch parameter. And the Birch parameter, this psi here, that's exactly what characterizes the interaction energy or the energy of the homogeneous system at unitarity in terms of the energy of the non-interacting system. This has been found to be um, around 0.38. If one takes the energies for the trapped system up to 20 particles or 30 particles, what one finds is that the Birch parameter, this psi, is a little bit higher. So it's not quite at the limit of the homogeneous system. Of course, that's not really a surprise. One, we are looking at very small particles. And two, these energies here um, are also calculated with approximate techniques. So the fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo energies are a little bit higher than the true eigen energies. So I think sort of this way of thinking about the problem gives us another way of connecting the few body physics with the many body physics. And this Birch parameter being the only parameter in the system really connects nicely with the fact that in hyperspherical coordinates, we just get this one number here that I left undefined, this one number that really describes how the effective hyperradial potential looks like. So we can um, push this a little bit further and look at the data um, in a little bit more detail um, that's done on this slide here. And I mentioned to you before that there's essentially no shell structure. If we take the spin balance data and we subtract the fit from it, then we see sort of these re residual oscillations. So there's a little bit of a resemblance of shell structure, but really very little is left. 
And the other thing that um, is shown here is the um, gap, the excitation gap, which is defined in this way. So we are now looking at a spin imbalance system, and we are basically looking at how much does the energy of the spin imbalance system differ from the next two neighboring balanced um, systems. So if we look at this, we pick this red point here, we look at how much for higher does this red guy lie compared to the neighboring green points, the spin balanced energies. And if we look at this, we see this type of behavior. There are different fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo um, calculations that are on here for the excitation gap compared to a density functional theory calculation. And overall, the agreement is reasonable. The excitation gap for the trapped system is sort of off the order of h bar omega, and thus increase slowly with the number of particles. So there's not quite enough data here to uniquely determine what the scaling is with the number of particles. Okay, so... Um, so far, I've talked a little bit about the energies of these two component Fermi gases, the excitation gap. And sort of as a last thing, what I want to touch on a little bit is how do we go beyond energy? So what, what, what other quantities are interesting to look at? And so one of the uh, quantities that is interesting is the momentum distribution. And we can um, define this via the one-body density matrix. Um, I've written this down here in terms of the wave function. So we take the many-body wave function and say replace the first coordinate here, r, with an r prime. And we look at how that sort of correlated. So pictorially, I take a particle, I keep all the other particles fixed, and I move this particle to a new position and that defines my one-body density matrix. can also define this in terms of um, a destruction operator. So I destroy a particle at R, and then I create a particle at R prime. Gives us the same quantity. And then from the one-body density matrix, we can actually get the momentum distribution simply via this expression here. And then if we have the momentum distribution, it's a 3D quantity. So to look at this in a little nicer way, we can do a partial wave decomposition and look at the um, zero projection or the lowest contribution of the momentum distribution. And that's what I'm showing on the next slide for just four particles, two up particles and two down particles for the ground state. So this is the energy of the four-body system from the weakly attractive regime all the way to unitarity. The lowest ground state has vanishing orbital angular momentum. And for this system, the momentum distribution is shown here. Um, what we see is that as we go from the non-interacting regime to, say, unitarity, and then beyond unitarity, on the one hand, the peak decreases, and on the other hand, the tail actually becomes larger and more pronounced. And of course, large momentum corresponds to a small length scale, and so this is indicative of the formation of pairs, and Frederick will talk a little bit more about the connection of the momentum distribution to the contact in his um, talk. So this is sort of nice because we can see signatures of the formation of pairs. But to really see pair formation, what we should be looking at is we should be looking at the correlation of pairs. And uh, we can do this by looking at um, this sort of slightly more complicated expectation value when we say we destroy not just one particle, but we destroy the um, one up particle and one down particle, and we recreate them. So schematically, I've indicated this here. Again, I start with my four-particle system. 
I take an up and down particle, I move it to a new position, and I get this. On the left, this example is sort of for a case where I have a good pair. So what I mean by this is I grab, you know, I imagine I'm on the BEC, BEC side, I have two pairs that have been formed, and I grab the pair and move it to a new position. On the right, I've um, taken a um, pair that's far apart, and so in some sense, I can think about this as I'm destroying a pair, I'm moving a pair that's not a good pair to start with because the two particles are far away from each other. And if I look at the um, pair density matrix here, then I should keep in mind that both types of situations contribute. When um, we look at this pair density matrix, we actually do something in addition. We don't just destroy two particles and create two particles. What we do is we actually switch to the relative and center of mass coordinates of our pair. And we leave the interparticle distance intact. So the R12 is unchanged. And we just change the center of mass vector. And that's exactly what I've done here. I've grabbed the pair, the interparticle spacing distance vector is intact, but the pair is moved in its entirety. And that really gives us a measure of the condensate fraction of pairs. So if we look at the momentum distribution, the pair momentum distribution, define an analogy to the um, single particle density um, single particle um, momentum distribution, then we see this type of a picture. This is on a log-log plot, and we see clearly two bumps here. This is for, again, four particles. There's this first bump and the second bump. The first bump does not depend much on the scattering lengths. So all these scattering lengths are positive. So I'm on the BEC side. And as I go from the bottom here to the top, I'm actually going deeper into the BEC limit. And this first bump here clearly comes from essentially having two non-interacting bosons of mass, 2m. If you look very carefully, you can actually see analytical curves on top that trace the numerical results almost exactly and in this small momentum region, well, it's not so small, but in this momentum region, it's really treating the system as consisting of two bosons of mass, 2m. And then in this regime here, the large momentum portion, um, we treat the system as consisting of two large pairs with internal structure. So that contribution is coming from what I called earlier, moving bad pairs around. And there's clearly a dependence on the S-wave scattering lengths in this system. So of the message that I want to bring across here is that if we look at a four-atom system, we can really think about this as a minimal model. It already shows us aspects such as the condensation of pairs. And I think that is really neat because we have essentially a full analytical treatment of this um, four-particle system at least um, for, for certain observables. And so I think I'll um, take some questions here, if you have some, and then we take a little break, and then we come back and I talk about bosons.